airing first on Asheville FM, This is the Final Straw, a weekly anarchist, anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting from occupied Saligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from people, projects, and struggles around the world engaging in the long project toward liberation. You can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or at protonmail.com or send us letters at P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This week we are super pleased to present an interview that I did a few weeks ago with Gabriel Kuhn and Maxida Marek on the 2019 PM press release Liberating Satmi, Indigenous Resistance in Europe's Far North. This book, of which Kuhn is the author and editor and Marek is a contributor, details a political history of the Sami people whose traditional lands extend along the northmost regions of so-called Norway, Sweden, Finland, and parts of Russia, as well as interviews conducted with over a dozen Sami artists and activists. Maxida Marek is a Sami activist and hip-hop artist who has done extensive work for indigenous people's justice. All of the music in this episode is by Maddock and used with her permission. In this episode, we speak about the particular struggles of Sami folks, ties between indigenous people all around the world, and many more topics. And now, here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Okay. Before I say anything else, I have to be sure to point out that I don't know what I'm talking about. I know, that only doesn't stop me from filling up seven to eight minutes of bathroom break, but I just want to point out that I have no internet, and all I know about the situation in Seattle is what I hear from the mainstream media, which may or may not be accurate or informed. Because it's happening even as I record this, and because it seems like something I've been advocating, I want to at least draw attention to the fact that some serious is going down in Seattle. I'm hoping the seriousness of it isn't lost in the white noise of the times, because everything is seemingly overwhelming now, from the zombie apocalypse to the widespread insurrections and protests, and now Seattle. Just when you think the biggest thing ever just happened, the next bigger thing comes along. I think the events in Seattle could be that. I hope they are. So, this is what I think I know based on oblivious misinformation provided to me from the Disney Corporation. Six blocks in Seattle, Washington have been declared an autonomous zone. They didn't burn down a police precinct. They took it from the cops and kicked the cops out. They call themselves the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, or CHAZ. As far as I can tell, city and state authorities would like to have their city back. You know how delusional hierarchs are. Giving orders isn't any fun unless they've got people to give the orders to. They want their precinct and their city blocks and their subjects returned to them. So, they're negotiating the return of the autonomous zone to the delusional hierarchs. I, for one, hope that never happens. I'm a fan of autonomous zones. Seattle Rebels' use of those particular words makes me hopeful that they're anarchists. I don't know for sure, but I'm unaware of anyone else who uses the terminology. To declare yourself an autonomous zone is to say that you are now separate and independent from all existing authority structure. But also, it takes on the implication that it also rejects authority structures generally. In other words, An autonomous zone isn't just a physical space autonomous from surrounding jurisdictions, but it's a space where everyone in it is autonomous. It's a zone where autonomous people interact to maintain themselves and their space. Exciting s***. Lord Churchill, a hero of mine, has written that rebellion accomplishes, in part, the opening of free spaces where the existing system cannot impose itself. These become crucial to the spread of rebellion because these free spaces provide opportunity for social experimentation, imaginative and creative exercises in consensus and cooperation. But also these become ungoverned and ungovernable spaces, holes, 
so to speak, in the matrix, where folks can plot and plan and spread to other spots. In my opinion, the most important thing is that an autonomous zone inspires others to think of the possibilities. What I mean is, if rebels in Seattle can do this, why can't rebels in Detroit or Chicago or Baltimore? No offense to Seattle, but there's nothing special about the people in those six blocks. None of them dropped in from the planet Krypton. They're not wearing a cape and tights and underwear on the outside of their pants. So this is my thinking in this moment. We might be all inclined to head to the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone to be part of this momentous and historic event. I'm not sure how logistically feasible that would be. I'm just saying, a massive influx of people to any spot creates a drain on food and toilet paper there. It's not always helpful. My uninformed advice is to get in contact with Chaz Rebels. Maybe look up any web presence that's out there. Send emails or tweets rather than just crashing their party. My next piece of unsolicited advice is for fans of the Autonomous Zone to consider establishing one of their own. Why go to Seattle when you can bring Seattle to where you are? I have no doubt that Seattle Rebels would be generous with information how they did this. No doubt there's some radio station in Seattle with questionable decision-making skills that broadcast the final straw. So I hope Rebels are listening. We need a series of ski mask clad TED Talks posted on how this went down. Then Rebels everywhere can duplicate this process, can evolve the process, share new tactics and strategies, open new free spaces, create autonomous zones. This is important for a few reasons. First. The orange moron dictator has said he'll send federal troops to take back the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. To stop him and the Fort Goblin High Command, we got to create 10 or 50 or 100 autonomous zones. Too many for someone with Trump's tiny alligator brain to keep up. That relieves pressure that the hierarchs can bring to the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Want to defend the Autonomous Zone? Create another one. Second. The replication of autonomous zones becomes one of the engines driving this existing system toward its own demise. We're talking about pockets where the existing order no longer operates, causing disruption to the production and distribution process. As those pockets grow and multiply, the old order dies. Third, as the system collapses, as it should, these autonomous zones serve as the social space where we create our own societies that will carry us into the future after cataclysmic systems collapse. I hope I haven't gotten too theoretical here. I'm not trying to bore you to sleep like Noam Chomsky does. I'm just thinking out loud about why this is important. This is important. We all need to support the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle any way we can. Anyone there who wants to let me know what I can do, including maybe shutting up, can contact me by email via jpay.com through my Virginia State number. But just to be clear, I was just being polite. I probably won't shut up. But I will do anything else. This might be too early to say this, but I hope I'm right when I say this. Look at six blocks in Seattle. This is what the future looks like. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain in Exile from Ohio with Buckingham Correctional in Dillon, Virginia. If you're struggling by any means necessary to create the next autonomous zone, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at Sean Swain number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, P.O. Box 430, Dillwyn, Virginia 23936. You can find his past writings recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. My name is uh, Maxila Marak. I work as a um, hip-hop artist and producer. I've been acting quite a bit before I started to do music, and I'm also known for being an activist in indigenous groups, and especially for the Samis, because I'm, I'm Sami. We are the native people of the uh, Scandinavian North. We live and breed in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and parts of Russia. 
So for people that are critical, they will probably know me as a, an activist artist, I would say. I don't know what, what more I can, I live in Jokmok, which is up north in Sweden. I have a daughter, she's eight years old. Mm. And yeah, that's me. Nice. Parts of. So my, my name is Gabriel Kuhn. I was born and raised in Austria, and then I left the country about 25 years ago and um, moved around a lot until I uh, ended up in Sweden in 2007. And I've been living here since and work as a writer and translator and am uh, involved in various uh, social and uh, political projects. So firstly, I'd love to start out with a question for Gabriel. We're here to talk about your book, Liberating Sapmi, which came out uh, this year, in fact, from PM Press. Would you lay out some groundwork about this book and how you came to writing and compiling it? Yeah, so the book, basically, it's an introduction to Sami history with a focus on the political struggle of the Sami people and anti-colonial resistance. And the book is laid out, it has two major parts. So there's an, an introduction which I wrote and which is called A Short Political History of Sapmi. Uh, so Sapmi being the traditional homeland of the Sami people. And um, that provides uh, general background information. And then the, the main part of the book, which makes up about two thirds, are interviews with 12 Sami artists, activists and scholars. So, so, so Maxida is one of them. In addition, there are illustrations in the book, photographs and artwork, and there is a resource guide at the end of the book, which has information about more English language literature and music and film and some online uh, sources that people can look into. And the reason I got the idea for the book was that I thought such a book was missing on the English language market. Mm. There are quite a few books about the Sami people in English. Some of them are very good, but most of them are academic studies. They are hard to find, um, or they're quite expensive. So my intention was to do a book that was accessible, easy to read, easy to get, affordable, and that's how the idea came about. I loved the the interview component of the book. The the introduction was really, really well like well done and I loved it too. But I loved also the intertwining of the interview component in the book and bringing in voices from all over Sotme and, you know, from all of these different sort of backgrounds and that was the most important part. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I wonder, Maxida, if I could ask you, insofar as this is possible, would you speak about that on the history of Sami and um, the history of Sami people who live on the land? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah. Well, we are indigenous people, so we've been, uh, we've been where we are for what you can tell over 10,000 years. The hard part is, Sweden always wanted to categorize mm. us as uh, a minority, which we are, but not just a minority. We are indigenous, and mm -hmm. I think the uh, one of the hard things uh, to ha have been to prove that is because we have a history of not leaving trails, that we are guests in the nature, so we haven't left anything to find, really. No big marks, but we are indigenous people. We've been very isolated because we live in the northern part of Sweden, which is, for many people, I think, unknown ground. When you travel far up north in Sweden, if I talk just about Sweden now and, and Norway, Finland, mm -hmm. it's a lot different. The The landscape is a lot different from the middle part of Sweden and down to the south. So it was kind of hard to live there if you if you didn't know how to use the ground and how to hunt and, and fish. Um, so we, we've been kind of isolated. 
Then around the 16th century, like in many other places in the world, the church became very central mm. and started to travel to make a long, a very long story short. They started to, to go further up north and, and one, of course, tried to get the psalmist uh, into the church for the same reasons that, I mean, they treated the psalmies the same way they treated indigenous people all around the world. So it was a battle between religions, I would mm. say, only the fact that, that the Psalmist never went to war. We don't even have a, a name for war in the Psalmist language. We've never been a, a people of war. Mm. We've been mistreated and killed and slaughtered like other indigenous people. And I can just go on and on of how, how they've been treating us. I can say that we, we, uh, we are... The Islamic culture is very different uh, from the Swedish culture, mm. um, which is also, uh, I mean, it's what I notice is it's hard to combine the Swedish culture and the Islamic culture, or the non islamic culture and, the, and the, the Islamic culture, because we live a lifestyle that is not, what our goal is not profit. We have reindeers, we still do reindeer herding, we are the only people in Scandinavia that does reindeer herding. In Sweden, we have no wild reindeers anymore, so it's just like cattle, but they are free. Now, we have the language, our history of the York. Like I said, I mean, I could go into specific uh, areas, so if there's anything uh, specific you want to talk about, I can, I can tell you. I mean, I was um, very struck. I mean, this is a very complex <laughs> a very complex question, because how do you distill the uh, ten thousand plus year history of a people into an answer to a sentence? But um, I think that the the groundwork that you laid just now will like be very useful for listeners in like just conceptualizing the things that we're speaking about. And I do want to talk about reindeer some more. I want to talk about music. I want to talk about a bunch of other stuff that I think will come up. I can tell you one thing that I, that I usually tell people that don't know, really know what Psalmies are. Mm. And that is that I feel more related to my Native American friends and my Inuit friends than I, that I feel related to my Swedish friends. So our culture is, is very similar to the other uh, more known indigenous people. And that's a good way to explain it that, we are not Swedish. Like the culture is very, very, very different from the Swedish culture. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, there was a question that I had later in the interview about sort of the construction of race and the construction of whiteness as it relates to Sami folks. And I was... That's a very interesting topic mm -hmm. and very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because of the way that I, I'm, I like was born and raised here on Turtle Island and my understanding of race is very specific and very culturally rooted here. And I was, I was wondering if you had any words on sort of the construction of, you know, race and whiteness and as it, re as it relates or does not relate to Sami folks hmm. or, you, or you specifically. This is so interesting because in Sweden... Uh, they never ask me this question because the topic is so toxic, mm -hmm. and we don't even. I mean, in Sweden, you don't you don't say race like you can't even mention it. I, I I've noticed when I've been in the U.S. or in Canada, that people come up to me and ask, "What race are you?" And if you, you could never do that in Sweden, never do that. That word is like banned which is, uh, I mean, for good reasons often. But for some, it's, I mean, that is it's so interesting to talk about because one thing that we don't always have in common to other indigenous people is that you can't always tell if a person is non-Swedish mm -hmm. or if, if they're Sami. We look very different. Like, I have friends that are very tall, very light skinned. Um, you couldn't tell the difference between a, a non Sami person and, and, and that person, but that person could still be a Sami. 
And then I have friends in my own family that are very dark, like, like, like I said, like the people ask me all the time where I'm from, they can't really put a finger on it. Like, mm. where is she from? And that's been, because that is one of the, of course, terrible things when it comes to racism, that you get categorized and in what race you are and valued by the, the tone of your skin. And that is horrible. But it's also been one of the things that has have been, I think, hard for some sometimes that we have to hold on so tight to the other culture things we have as Sami because you can't really tell by just looking at us all the time. And I know I've heard stories from my elders that when Sweden came, when I say Sweden, I mean like the church or we call it Lappfugdar. I don't know the, if there is a name in English, but there were certain people that collected taxes that could actually tell Sami women that they, they've been cheating, fooling around because they have kids that look so different. They could have one kid that was so dark and one that was so light. So, I mean, that is that is a question that I think that it's even toxic to talk about among Samis, I think, actually. Of course, I mean, and we have groups in Sakhmi that are very against mixing between Samis and non-Samis still, like that you should keep the blood pure. And they, they I they live on, in specific areas. More areas are more into that than, than others. And definitely how connected you are to the ranger herding. I mean, only 10% of the Sami population in Sweden is actually working with, as a reindeer herder. And that's not a lot, but it's still one of the biggest and most important thing in the Sami culture. And that becomes very important. Like if you have, a, are you in the reindeer herding business or not? And how many, how much of uh, non-Sami blood do you really have? I mean, that is definitely a topic, um, but it's very toxic to talk about. And if do you have a last name? Do you have a Sami last name? And I belong to one of the people. I, I do have a Sami uh, last name, and many people don't. And but there's a reason for it because mm-hmm. the Swedes, I mean, Sweden came and took it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we see now the result of what they've done to the Sami people. That is very hard for specific groups in Sami. To, to be a full Sami <laughs> because they don't have a last name. They don't do reindeer herding. They don't have a membership in a Sami village. And that is not, there's nobody's folk but, but Sweden and Norway. So, yeah, definitely, this is something that, that does exist. Can I give an example? Yes, please. A, such a good example. Like, I have a daughter. She's Miki Sunna. She's turning eight this summer. I come from a very culture Sami family, uh, Marak, and my grandfather, he passed away, uh, yeah, this December. He was a living legend, Mm -hmm. and now he's just a legend, but I mean, he was one of the greatest people we've had in Sami. He was the first Sami that became a priest that combined the Sami religion with the church, he helped so many people. He brought back Yoik to the church when it was still forbidden, when it was a sin. So my family is very like known for the for that part of the Sami culture, like the Yoik and, and the storytelling. And the person that I have, my daughter's father, his name is Pirak. So his name is Anta Matthias Pirak, and he comes from a very known reindeer herding family they've been doing reindeer herding for i mean all the time and his grandfather was well known well known so my daughter she is now brought up in such a strong Sami culture family like she has two heavy last names and her first name is also very like heavy Mikisuna, Marak Tirak. she knows how to to ride a snowmobile four wheeler she has reindeers. We have a lot of cottages up in, in different places in Sakhmi, Pajilanta. 
she has the whole package. And she looks like a little elf, you know. They will never, no one will never question her of her heritage, where she's from. Everybody knows her parents, her parents' name, grandparents, the areas that we're from. I mean, the history goes way back. No one will ever question her. She has a friend, and I won't mention her name, but her mother is, well, what we, between us, could say is mixed. She's a little bit Sami, a little bit Finnish, a little bit Swedish, a little bit something, something, you know. And her mother, I mean, she she was searching for her Sami roots when she was a grown-up. So she has not been brought up in the Sami culture. She has the daughter with a man from France. So the kid is very mixed. I mean, she's amazing. So my daughter and her friend, they went to the same preschool which is a Sami preschool for the Sami kids. So you can speak your language. So you, um, I mean, you get a foot into Sami culture. It's made mainly for reindeer herding kids. When they were supposed to start school, this friend went to the Swedish school instead of the Sami school. And the main reason why she started Swedish school instead is because her parents wanted to spare her for being that kid in the class that is the least Sami of them all. But she, have, she has no cottages. Uh, nobody knows her grandparents. Mm-hmm. She has no connection to the ranger herding whatsoever. Like she's, she's just a kid, but she's, of course, a Sami. I mean, she has Sami blood, but she has not been brought up in a, a Sami culture or family, which can actually make it pretty hard because all the other kids are so connected. They have we have this I don't know what it is, but I mean it's it's a special connection. You share everything and all the kids go to the reindeer herding things and, and all the kids go to the cottages during the summer and the winter time. And this kid would be an outsider from that. Mm. And she will get questioned when they grow up. Like people will start questioning her. How much Sami are you? Like, where are you from? Do you really belong here? I won't say that 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 would definitely happen, but there's a risk. I wouldn't act the way that her parents did Mm -hmm. because I believe that we are actually developing now and are not as harsh as they were before. But, I mean, of course, there's a risk. And I don't think the Swedish people know this that there's such a cultural difference between the Samis and the non-Samis that they wanted to spare her from a young age, from not being the outsider that, that wasn't Sami enough. So that's just an example, because I've been thinking a lot about this, like, did they do the right thing? I think they should have put her to Sami school, so because she would probably grow up like her mother and, and wonder, like, hey, why did you do this? Like, I have a connection to this world as well, and you made a choice for me. Uh, because this is, in one way, a choice. Like, I know this for a fact because I live in Jokmok. In Jokmok, there are only, like, 3,000 people in this little town. So here it's very much like, did you go to the Sami school or not? If you didn't, you have to explain yourself why. Okay, so now you're good. Now, now you want to become a Sami. You didn't have to to go through all the shit that we did that went to the Sami school, getting bullied and whatnot. But now that you're a grown up, now you want to become a Sami and have a traditional costume. And okay, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. So, so this is very. I mean, you can see this in, in different cultures, but in Sweden, I don't think that people have any idea of how it is. This is The Final Straw Radio, and I'm William Goodenough. You're listening to an interview with Maxida Marek and Gabriel Kuhn about the 2019 release Liberating Sopmi, Indigenous Resistance in Europe's Far North, available now through PM Press. You are hearing a track in Swedish by Marek, whose title I won't try and pronounce, but which carries general Antifa sentiments. 
All tracks will be linked in our show notes at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. Thank you so much for that example. I think that like what you're bringing up for me is making me think of really just complex currents of understanding and belonging, especially in communities and in people that are heavily impacted by the ongoing violences of colonialism and how like complex that can look. Gabriel, I would love to ask a little bit more about the book and about like your process in writing the book and about sort of how you approached this kind of research and history work as somebody who is outside of the community that you are seeking to uplift and um and like do this kind of work with and i'm wondering what sorts of things should other researchers keep in mind in your opinion if they are seeking to do this kind of work as well so i i think this is a, a very important question. It's also a question that makes me uh, slightly uncomfortable mm. for, for <laughs> the, because just the fact that I um, decided to do this book as an outsider doesn't necessarily mean that I know how to do that mm. or that I did it the right way. So um, <laughs> am, I'm sure there are plenty of things that I could have done better. I'm sure that people have very valid criticisms in general. I don't think there's a blueprint for how to do this. So all I can say in response to your question, it's all going to be very subjective. Obviously, I gave that much thought before I embarked on the project. I mean, this was in many ways, but also in, in, in this way, a, a very special project for me because let's say I work on a book about sports or I work on a book about mm -hmm straight edge. I do not question my validity as an author. If I feel I have a good idea for a book and I find a publisher who wants to release the book, then I get to work and do the best I can, but I don't really go through a process of asking myself, is, is this really my place? Now with this book, that was a very big question. That was the decisive question at the beginning. I felt that I had a good idea, but I was not sure whether I was the right person to do it. So the first thing I did, which um, I guess maybe is the first part of, of answering your question, the first thing I did was basically to look for 
approval within the Sami community. Now, the Sami community is no monolithic block. People have different opinions. There are no individual Sami who can speak for the whole community. But I was looking for feedback and opinions of people I knew and people whose thoughts for different reasons were particularly important to me. And then I mentioned it because I always, I also mentioned it in, in the preface to the book. I remember there was one very important uh, phone conversation I had very early on with uh, Anders Sunna, a Sami mm-hmm. painter who uh, Maxida knows well. And I a big fan of his work and I and I also wanted him to be uh, one of the people in the book that I interview which then he agreed to and so very early on in the process I had a conversation with him on the phone and I presented the idea to him and and was just wondering what he thought and quite frankly had he said at that point uh I don't think that's a very good idea or I don't think you should be doing a book like that I might have drop the project right away but he didn't say that I mean he was rather encouraging and so I reached out to more people and I also got encouragement from and 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 so through those steps I started to see a path that I thought I could follow and reach a a satisfying result now what was important along that path I think a lot of that is actually common sense, although I'm aware of the fact that historically people who have written books about communities that they themselves not belong to didn't necessarily follow those common sense guidelines. But one thing that I felt was was important was just that I was very clear about my position and what I was able to do and not able to do. So I have no firsthand experience of Sami culture. I am not an expert scholar on Sami culture. My approach comes from a, a long-standing interest in indigenous peoples and their struggles for justice. And so because of this interest throughout the years, because of travels I did and studies I did and many conversations I had, I felt that I acquired enough knowledge that allowed me to basically build a platform, in this case, for Sami voices to reach a broader international audience. So to make this really short, I just felt I could be a facilitator to spread knowledge that I thought was important. And then the second part related to that, and this is maybe even more common sense, is that in in the process of working on the book, obviously, I'm 100% dependent on Sami contributors and mm-hmm. Sami advisors. And, and in that process, you got to be respectful. You got to be honest about your intentions. You have to acknowledge people's contributions, put the community at the center of the project and not yourself. And again, I cannot speak for how well I managed to do that, but that's, this is what I tried. I can maybe add one more thing that I think helped in this process, which is that this is not a book that I will make a lot of money off. Uh, this is it's mm-hmm. not a book that helps me with an academic career that I do not have. And it helped, I think, because those aspects add yet another layer of of ethical questions that I think are difficult sometimes to deal with. So luckily, I I didn't have to deal with those. So so I think that also made it, in a sense, easier. I think there are very general guidelines that would probably be useful for anyone embarking on such a project. But then, of course, it very much how that plays out specifically very much depends on the specific project that people are working Mm -hmm. on, like where they are at, what their position is, what their relationship is with the communities they, they write about. So it's Exactly. There is no blueprint. I think there are some general guidelines, but but if you decide to do a project like that, the, the specifics you have to work out 
in that specific project you're working on. One thing I am curious about, Gabriel and Maxita, what kinds of support for Sami issues is there among far left and anarchist spaces and anarchist people in Scandinavia and sort of any invitations or provocations that you might have for how people how people around the world, but specifically how people on the land can have y'all's back a little bit better, or if they're doing something really well and you want to name that, I would love to hear that. How about this? I, I can say something about my experiences here in the, in the broader activist community, because that, in a sense, that was also a... Uh, I don't know if motivating factor is the right word, but but it played into my idea of, of doing this book. And I know that Maxida has to add a few things to what I'm going to say. And then we can maybe look at more specifically what especially uh, into people outside of the Nordic countries can do to support Sami struggles. So if I just speak about this, my, my experience here with the, with the so-called activist community, it was very surprising to me when I first came to Sweden in 2007 because from the time I spent in North America and Australia and New Zealand, my sense was that, again, very broadly speaking, the activist communities there, with all the flaws and shortcomings and mistakes that we all make, at least had a very clear and I felt sincere ambition to be good allies, accomplices, collaborators, whatever the preferred terminology was, to indigenous people, so to stand in solidarity with them. And I kind of expected that to be the case here as well, but I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at the non-Sami activist communities in the Nordic countries, to me, there was, and I, maybe it has changed since I came here, but I think there still is a surprising level of ignorance. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but if you talk to the average sort of leftist radical activist in, say, Stockholm, mm -hmm. they're often very well versed in what's happening in Palestine, Chiapas, perhaps even on the Pine Ridge Reservation, but they're very ignorant about what's happening in Sapmi. And I thought about this a lot, and I think there are a few reasons for this, and I've not really come to, to conclusions, so these are kind of guesses. But, I mean, one thing is that this ignorance is a reflection of general ignorance among mainstream society here about the Sami people. So, so in that sense, it's a reflection, but I think there are other issues as well. One is, I think that historically, the left, and that reaches from social democracy to the, to the far left in the Nordic countries, was particularly, let's say, technocratic and progress oriented. Mm. So industrialization, technological process, science, including at the beginning of the 20th century, racial biology, all of that was supposed to be a way towards socialism, considered progressive. So if you have that picture, indigenous people like the Sami, basically a stumbling block. They don't fit into, into this picture. So I think that is one thing that, that you can still feel. People don't really know. It's something that doesn't fit into this historical leftist ideology. And so people have a very difficult time to deal with that. And more concretely, I think that is then enhanced by what, what I, as a complete outsider, because I'm not even originally from the Nordic countries, see as, as, as a bit of a cultural problem. What I mean by that is that here in, in the Nordic countries, maybe particularly in Sweden, people often have a really hard time with uh, dealing with conflict. Whenever there is conflict or there are certain issues that are complicated, people um, get very insecure and confused. Now, if you look at the broad activist communities here and the views that people have and the issues that are important and the norms that are often attached to it, some of them clash with the realities in Sakmi. So you take examples like animal rights, you know, I mean, people here in the left are often anti-hunting, uh, for example. Now, hunting is a uh, part of traditional Sakmi culture. Reindeer herds are protected from predators, for example, wolves. So here we have one example where that sort of clashes with what's often perceived as an anti-hunting norm. In the left, similar with environmentalism, people are in support of green energy, which I guess is fine. However, if you look at 
how that plays out in reality. Wind parks are predominantly established in South because that's where they least disturb mainstream society, although they majorly disturb reindeer herding. So there we have another conflict that, that some people on the left find difficult to deal with. Also things like national identity. Uh, a lot of Sami activists would speak of the Sami as a nation and find that important. We have one contributor to the book, for example, Asla Kohlenberg, who speaks of cultural nationalism as something, as something that's important, that clashes with some of the criticism of anything that has to do with, with the nation among the left here. And so I think rather than addressing these issues and accepting that that is challenging and through dialogue and conversation, which can be painful and complicated, modify your positions or advance your positions, people, I think, rather just shy away from that and pretend it doesn't exist, which means that very often, you know, some issues seem to become too complicated. And I can just as a, as a final example, which I thought illustrated this well, there is a, a well-known Swedish writer who writes a lot about the situation in the northern provinces of Sweden and the uh, urban rural divide, the social injustices implied in that. But he doesn't write anything about the Sami. And, and he once explained that, saying that, oh no, that topic is just too complicated. Whatever you write, it'll be wrong. Meaning that whatever you write, someone will criticize you for that, perhaps harshly. And while that may be true, and while I understand on a personal level that you don't want to put yourself in that position, if most people have that approach, you will miss out on debate. And then a third aspect right, that I might mention, and Maxida knows a lot about this because she has experienced all of that uh, firsthand, mm. is that if you look at the tactics that, again, the sort of average Nordic activist employs, and that's nothing that's specific about the Nordic countries, that's, that's true for all of Western Europe, it is very much based on an urban environment. So, you know, you can be a pretty anonymous figure with tense protests and meetings, but if you want to, you can go about your daily life pretty much undisturbed. This doesn't work in an environment like Sapmi or any rural environment for that matter, because people know you I and mean, there's no place to hide if you're outspoken on mm. certain issues, which also means that the risks you're taking are much higher and that demands a very different approach, I think, to political activism than what a lot of people in the urban general leftist activist communities are used to. So I think that, that creates yet another complication here. You done your job, Gabriel. Everything you said is exactly how it is. I mean, that is so correct. I mean, in Sweden, people are so afraid of conflict. And I'm sad to say that there's not a lot of true activists in, Swe in Sweden. I have a word, Lofos activist which actually means a fake activist. I know a lot of people and a lot of so-called activist groups that say that they fight for justice. When you come down to it, it's, it's not about justice at all. It's just about making yourself heard, making yourself look cool. But when it comes to the source, like what do we fight for? Or should we really fight? Shouldn't we try to gather? They back up. So like Gabriel said, there's a lot of so-called activists that uh, it clashes with the Sami way of living. One example is one of my close friends. He got prison, several years of prison, because he was accused of having killed a Wolverine. And I can tell you that his family, they got so harassed for years from the so-called activists, the animal friends. So, I mean, we struggle with <laughs> with both the politicians in Sweden, all the Swedish, the Swedish government and the so-called activists. A lot of the indigenous friendly people, they love to go to the US to protest. I mean, do you know how many people from Sweden that went to <laughs> when the pipeline thing? Standing Rock? Yeah, yeah. We had so many Swedes that went there for the Native Americans and you, they want to, I mean, 
put a feather on their fucking head and, and pretend to be some kind of a, a spirit animal. But they would never, never go up north to do the same for us. And I think that is also because Sweden, I mean, the, the history that we have is now you can really tell the difference, though, between, for example, the U.S. and Sweden. Sweden has been pretty protected from war. So the Swedish people don't know what a revolution is. The, the people in Sweden that have been abused are the indigenous people and the people that immigrated, of course, into Sweden. But the Swedish people have not been through trauma. So I think this is a result of that, that when it comes down to it, they get too afraid. They would never choose a side. Mm. Like you, if you ask the Swedish people, what do you vote for? 95% would not tell you ever. Never will they tell you. And if, if you do, you have a mark on your head. Like you're left and you're right. And you will live with that for the rest of your life. I mean, so that is like Gabriel said, I mean, it, it, it clashes. We have uh, a lot of so-called activists in Sweden, but to be honest, there's not a lot of real activism going on here in Sweden. And I can just agree to everything that he said. And it's very interesting to, to hear him speak about it. And he can see it from an outsider, like a different perspective, because I think that uh, Swedish people would probably not agree. And that is also why it's, it's, it's kind of hard to live in, in this world because sometimes it feels like we have everyone against us. You can never do anything right. The whole culture and the way that we live and breathe up here, it just doesn't combine to anything else in Sweden. We have, don't have the same, same tempo. And, and I think it, this is, of course, also the Swedish government and has been very good at keeping quiet, like not teaching some history. So when when we claim our rights, people don't even know that we exist. It's kind of hard to claim your rights if they don't know that we exist. And then we get questioned for that. So everything that Gabriel said is, is completely true, yeah. which is sad. It's very sad. It is, and it's making me think of sort of something that happens here a lot there's a a running not not a saying or anything like that but but sort of the the indigenous people here who've been kind enough to talk to me about issues around decolonization is lean into the discomfort because colonialism affects everybody and it affects you you know the colonizer in ways as well and it disproportionately affects people who are impacted by the ongoing violences of colonialism and colonization, but it affects everybody. So like lean into and decolonization is an uncomfortable process. It's not like sunshine and rainbows and puppy dogs, you know, it's like a, it's a, it's a very uncomfortable process. So like that's making me think of conversations that are, are, are happening here and are happening about, you know, the, the, the specific situations that are happening on this landmass, but um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you all so much for going into that. I'm wondering about if you have any ideas on or if you even want to like have have more of a solidarity with the far left. And what do you think it will take for that to happen if that's a desired thing? Definitely. But still, I think it's I think it's also a bit dangerous because mm. you you still want the right people to be on your side. I mean, the far left can also be fucking crazy. And I think one of the things that I try to tell people that, that come out as activists is you have to stop the fight. People love to put themselves into different groups and just fight among these groups. The more groups, the better. And I try to remind people that what is the goal? My goal is to get people to be on my side. Mm -hmm. And if I just stand there and scream and disrespect people and expect people to know everything about me already before they open their mouths, I, I mean, I will never get the respect back. So you want to have people from both sides to hold our backs. 
of course, not not not, not the right is right, <laughs> um, but I just I I feel that it it's dangerous to to categorize a whole culture to just be on the left. I think the goal is for people to understand that this is our norm. And we need people on every political party, except for the races, to be on our side. And not just activists, but normal people. You know what I'm saying? People that are non-activists, people that that, that don't dare to be an activist. You, you can't expect everyone to be the way that I am. I'm very outspoken and I'm very unafraid. Like, but people are not just like that. Everyone is not like that. So, of course, the goal is to get people on our side, but for the right reasons and in the right way. And you have to aim high. You have to aim for the a Swedish government. You can't just be a grassroots, you know? That's what I said when I started as an artist. And some people started questioning me when I went to big events with all kinds of people, like known artists and, and politicians. Like, what, what does she do? Why is she there? Like she used to be in the woods screaming. Yeah, I used to be in the woods screaming, but my goal was to be on the, around the fucking round table. I have to be up there with the big horses, you know, to speak out because I need them on my side, not just the grassroots community. You have to be, you have to aim high. Mm. So I want the Swedish government, that's my fucking goal, to get them on our side. And hopefully the, the next generation are smarter. But it's important to not just look at the, the leftists because then we put ourselves in that little group one more time. Mm. The group needs to be bigger and more welcoming. The rights that we claim, they're not weird. Like, it's why shouldn't we have our rights? Mm. Like, it's just this common sense. I mean, if we start to educate people in the Swedish history, the colonization, and what has actually been done to the Sami people, what is happening now to the Sami people, a lot of people will understand. Because I believe in the good in people. The dangerous thing is when you believe that most people come with bad intentions. If that is what you think about everyone, you you've already lost. And I have to believe in the good in people. Maybe I have to say things 10 times before you get it. But the 10th time, maybe you will get it. And then you will come over to my side. Because in the end, it's about human rights. You can rape a person. You can kill a person. And you get, I mean, they talk, the police talk to you for fucking 24 hours and then you're out again. But if you kill a Wolverine, you get two and a half years in prison. And that's only for reindeer herders because our cattle are free. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're not allowed to protect them because they're free. Like if we have them as cows or pigs, then it's different rules. But only some of the people have free cattle. So mm -hmm. we have different rules. I mean, that's just an example of how it looks today. And when you tell people this, a lot of people actually understand. I mean, I've, I've met all the big politicians in Sweden. I've done TV shows with a lot of them. And I've, I've been criticized for sitting with people that, that vote for a different party than I do. I'm, I'm very left. Like, my heart is to the left. But I have friends that are from different parties. And, of course, there, I, there's parties in Sweden that I would never, ever socialize with. Like, Svani Demokraten, which is a racist party. I would never do that. But I've been criticized for having friends that vote for different things than I do. But then I tell them, if they meet me and I'm the first and only Sami they will ever talk to and they hear my history, maybe I will change someone's political view. Maybe they will think different the next time the question about mining industry comes up. They will remember me. And they will remember that I respected them and they will remember my story. So maybe then the outcome will become different. So I just think that love and respect, I mean, it sounds very cliche, but that is actually very true. The dangerous thing with activism is the people that, that does it for the wrong reasons, for just for the fight. And in the end, 
We don't want to fight. We want peace. We have to live next to each other. We have to know how to combine different worlds. We have to, that is the only way that we can survive in the end is to get along, not to kill each other, not to fight. So that I think a true activist have to have that in mind. That of course I want the left to be on my side, Mm -hmm. but I also want the right to be on my side. And if they are on my side, they will become left. You know, the whole love and respect thing being a cliche, people really respond to to it positively. And I see people from all over the world just saying, like, we just need to understand. We just need to understand each other. And, yeah, so thank you for um, saying that. Um, I also have my boundaries, like, Nazi, Nazi and racist, that is a completely yeah. different question. It's just so you, yeah. For real. Just, <laughs> for real. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Just just real quick, since since we're not at the at the at the peace stage yet, but there are, there are struggles ongoing. I just wanted to get back real quick to to what you said uh, earlier, what was implied in your question about how people can uh, concretely support uh, Sami struggles mm. today if they wanted to. I was wondering, just a very practical thing, when when this is going to be aired. Uh, on on the website, can you add links to? Because I mean, there are mm. some campaigns that are ongoing about resistance to development projects, mining. Uh, there's a big plan for a, a railway that uh, is supposed to be built in the on the Finnish side of Sapmi. And mm. there are ongoing court cases about different things, land rights, hunting. Ah. The forest culling of reindeer herds. So, so, so there is information that that people could access, and then they could spread it. Or mm-hmm. Very often, there's then very concrete information on those websites uh, about how to get involved. You're listening to a track in Swedish right now, whose title I won't try and pronounce, but which comes off Marek's 2019 full-length release, Utopi. Link in the show notes. Jag kommer aldrig lämna dig 
Vi flyger över väglösland i natt Jag ropar jag behöver dig Kasta mig ut men landade ändå här Jag kommer aldrig ångra mig Du är som en annan värld för mig Dina vingar tar mig över I would be interested to hear from both of y'all about Maxida. You mentioned like far right Nazis and like racist parties. We have all seen like the rise of sort of a street level and government level, like far right, alt right, and fascism all around the world. I'm wondering what kinds of impacts that has has had on Sapmi and on you, y'all specifically? It's very, I think it's kind of uh, ironic because a lot of people are like, yeah, the, because we have Sari Demokraterna, it's called mm. the Swedish Democrats. And I often get a comment like, they would love you, Sapmi, because you're the, like, the, the native Swede. They don't, definitely not. No, no, no. They are against probably everything that we do and especially the reindeer herding and like all the parties except for the left ones unfortunately some of the left ones as well are for for example the mining industry and that we the Sami people and especially the reindeer herding take up so much land I mean they are against everything that is not really Swedish culture and we are I think when you start to talk about what Swedish culture is is where you can really see that the Samis are different from the Swedes. So, I mean, of course, we are, we are affected from it. And if they would get power, more power than they have, it would be a definite issue for the Sami villages mm-hmm. and for the reindeer herding industry, definitely. They want to open up the Sami villages. And this is kind of hard to explain because then I have to like explain what a Sami village is, but you could almost call it a tribe. And in this so-called tribe, you have to have a membership. And only if you have a membership, you can have reindeers. And we have specific areas in Sweden for every village that we can have our reindeers on. And on those areas for every specific village or tribe, we have fishing and hunting rights. And we are the only ones that actually can fish and hunt there because we are so-called protectors of it. So people won't come there for um, vacation, you know, sport fish or mm-hmm. whatever. And so that's one example. They, they want to open up the summer villages and make it free for everyone to have rangers and everyone to fish and hunt. And oh, the result of that would be a catastrophe. We would lose everything. So, I mean... Yeah, we are definitely affected and affected in in ways, of course, that they are just racist pigs that hate everyone that is not white. So if I can add maybe one thing that I think is interesting, if you observe the, especially the, the, the far right parties that now are in all the parliaments of the Nordic countries, so the, the Sweden Democrats here in Sweden and the so-called Progress Party in, in Norway and the true Finns in Finland, I think if you look at, at their policies toward the Sami, it's interesting because it, it reflects a trend on the far right that goes from, let's say, traditional, very crude forms of racism based in biology to you know, what's sometimes referred to as ethno-pluralist or basically cultural forms of racism. So I, I, I find it interesting that sometimes You can have representatives of those parties pay lip service to cultural traits of the Sami, the language or or traditional clothing or whatever, something that appeals ideologically to their idea of national coherence and unity and whatnot. However, at the same time, all of those parties explicitly deny any special 
social or political rights to the Sami as indigenous peoples mm. or just minorities. Mm. So what you end mm. up with, exactly. what you end up with is they are allowed to be part of the nation state project of Sweden or Norway or Finland as some kind of exotic spice, uh, possibly a showcase of how supposedly tolerant those people are because they let these minorities, you know, speak their language or whatever. But what it essentially means on the ground is that you deny them all civil and democratic rights, which are essential as a foundation of sovereignty and self-determination. Or if you want to put it the other way around, the only way that Sami can get civil and democratic rights is if they become fully assimilated as citizens in mm. the nation state project. And this is a very deceptive and therefore, I also think very dangerous form of, and I, I would speak of ongoing racism in that case, that that mm. these parties uh, represent. But I mean, and also as as Maxita said, I mean, you can see that very concretely. Like here in Sweden, for example, the Sweden Democrats are very clear in wanting to take away the exclusive right to rainy herding from the Sami. In Norway, Progress Party is very clear about wanting to abolish the, the Sami parliament, which is one of the most important, at least some symbolic uh, political institutions of the Sami, and they want to turn it into alternatively a museum or a hotel or whatever. Mm. So those attacks are very clear. This is nothing hidden, but they are sometimes accompanied by, as I said, these sort of, oh, but, you know, of course, the culture is great and the culture is beautiful. So so this is very dangerous. Now this this is now we come back like to the question that you asked before about race because here it becomes very important that we have to claim our rights and they question like either you're swedish or you're not what are you mm. so we get their question like gabriel said they they want to take all the rights away because if you if we live in sweden and we claim to be indigenous then why should we have special treatment that that is one thing that they really push on, like no special treatment for you guys, like and and this is just history repeating itself, and this is also why some people have memberships in some of the religious and some people don't. Like the, the some is the, did you reindeer herding before? The Swedish government in the history they let them keep their membership in the some of the religious. And if you did not do reindeer herding you got kicked out from the village and lost your membership. And it's the same way that the Swedish Democrats are do now. Like, either you're Swedish or you're not. You claim to be Sami, then get the fuck out of here. If, you're, if you want to still be in Sweden, then ask Swedish. I can just see history repeating itself once again. But I, like I'm saying, like, this is also very interesting. We live in a time now with climate change, for example, and now we have this fucking coronavirus just taking over the world. And I can almost laugh and say, like, they've been trying to kill us indigenous people <laughs> forever, but they never fucking succeeded. And why is that? Because in the end, the knowledge that we have is the most important knowledge. And that is one thing that I notice now in Sweden, that now people start to get more interested, like, oh, how do you live up there? And, and, and they want to learn, and even vegans are mm. thinking about learning how to hunt, because we see that when the world collapsed, money and gun, it doesn't work. You have nothing. That is a war that everyone is prepared for. So if you have guns and money and power, you can fight a war. But with climate change and a virus like this coming up, the most important thing that you know is indigenous knowledge. That is how you survive. I just wanted to, to say that because that is a change that I see now, mm -hmm. that now is the first time that I hear people becoming more interested in, in how we live. And this is probably also history of repeating itself. And this is probably why they never succeeded on killing us because something always happened in the world, like the catastrophe and trauma. And when it comes to that, it's a special kind of knowledge that you need to know. It's a special way of living that you need to know that will make us, that will make us all survive. And I just find that quite interesting, actually. That is really interesting. 
this gets into kind of a question that I had about specifically about reindeer herding. I was interested in reading Gabriel's introduction to liberating Sotmi, sort of horrified to read that Sweden or like the colonial governments were sort of gatekeeping um, Sami identity by, and maybe this is a misrepresentation and please let me know if I'm, if I'm misrepresenting the situation, but gatekeeping Sami identity by saying essentially that if you don't herd reindeer, you're not Sami. Is that correct? I, th I think it's specific. What, what is true is that specifically in Sweden, you have the strong distinction, which comes from a law from the early 20th century between reindeer herding Sami and, and non-reindeer herding mm. Sami. There were there were some particular rights granted to reindeer herding Sami that were not granted to other Sami, and that is a, a classical example for a colonial divide and conquer mm. strategy that have caused that has caused big problems also within the Sami community, which which maintain to this day. So I think this is the part that you're probably referring to. Yeah, but I mean, parts of it are still existing. Definitely, like I said before, if you have to have a membership in the Sami village to have reindeers, for example. And 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 with, with, with having a membership, you get specific rights. If you don't have a membership, you don't have the same rights. And that is also a part of that old history and what Gabriel talked about. And that has definitely been, still is, a very toxic conflict in Sápmi mm. that that forces Sámis to um, fight against each other because we still have families to try to get back their membership in these Sámi villages. But we, there's not enough space for them to have reindeers. Like, we only are allowed to have a certain amount of reindeers because we only have this and this much land to be on. So, I mean, the conflicts that we have in Sápmi are, are horrific, and mm -hmm. that is a definite result of the Swedish history and how they treated us. That now we are left to solve all this without any rights as a indigenous people. It's very hard to to solve these conflicts. So that is uh, definitely still existing, that the reindeer herders have rights that non-reindeer herders uh, mm. don't have. But then one could add maybe that the rights of the reindeer herders are, are also controlled by the government. So so the that's where, that's where the forced culling comes in, for example, because the number of reindeer that an, a specific uh, Sami village can have is still determined by the nation state government. And if the numbers mm. are too big, the government will come in and say, okay, you have to slaughter mm. uh, whatever, 20% of your herd because your herd is too big. Mm. Um, and this is one of the, some of the most current prominent examples of conflicts uh, in court between uh, mm. Sami and, and the governments. It's really reminding me of the government of Canada and how the government of Canada really like gatekeeps and detrimentally affects, you know, the lives and identities of the indigenous people who live there. And I would be really interested in hearing y'all's take on. So Sapmi is a f pretty large territory. It spans many hundreds of miles and it gets crossed by several colonial borders, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Russia. And I know in Canada, there are many like the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and Mohawk and uh, Coastal Salish, all, all of those territories are also crossed by like a very heavily militarized colonial border to say nothing of the colonial border in the South. And I'm wondering how that colonial border has affected sort of the relationships between folks that like, who are Sami who live in, in Sápmi. Um, I wonder if y'all have any words on that. I would say that this is a beautiful thing with this culture that we still see Sápmi as, if we could say like one land, so for us, we know, I feel, I mean, I, I, I'm Lula Sama, which is one type of Sami. And I have, like my people, we go way into Norway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I speak the same language, have the same traditional clothing as a lot of people in Norway. 
So for us, they they are non-existing. We really see Sápmi as one area without borders. But of course, I mean, we notice that they are there. It uh, affects the rain journey a lot. But I think for us, no, that that is one of the most beautiful things in in the Sápmi culture that that we don't have any borders. Like we have family in every in every country and travel like no one's did before over the borders as well and and everyone knows everyone but political definitely uh, we notice it mm. the practical problems i mean just right now with the pandemic i mean the you know again with the oh, oh my god with the european union and special uh, treaties with norway since that opened up the borders uh, but generally oh. i think they've sort of lost some of the significance they've had up to 20 years ago but just just right now i mean all the borders came back up and um i just emailed with a couple of days ago or texted with, with people who live uh, along the diatno river which for a very long stretch of a few hundred kilometers marks the border between between finland and norway and you have sami families literally on the opposite side of the river so so some of them would live mm-hmm. in, in what, finland and, and the others in norway and now suddenly with the borders coming back up, it becomes difficult for them to to visit one another. So obviously the practical complications that these borders create and have created, I mean, they were partly responsible for forced migration historically. I mean, that, oh. that remains, but as Maxida points out, that would have been my impression from talking really to everyone. I've, every Sami I've talked to also in connection with the book, the stress that for Sami identity, those national borders don't matter. And that that would also include the Sami community in Russia, which especially throughout the 20th century with the Iron Curtain was 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 very isolated Mm. from the rest of the Sami community. But but my sense is, and I, you know, uh, Maxida would assume would would confirm that, is that they are a clear part of the Sami family and community because of the strong historical and cultural ties. Yeah, thank you for talking about that. Thank you so much for your time and your willingness for coming onto the show. It was an absolute honor to get to speak to y'all about the work that y'all are doing and your experiences. Um, Is there anything that we missed in this interview that you want to give voice to in closing? Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Shut up, my native. Uh, I think one of the powerful things is that, like percent in in percent, we are not that many Sámis, and there are not that many Inuits in Greenland and whatnot. But wow, what a huge group we are as Indigenous people, and that is so powerful to see. Some of my closest friends are Indigenous from different countries, and when we ally and hold each other's backs. I mean, the government should fucking be where this new generation coming up and just how easy it is now to have contact with one another, <laughs> like my best friend Tim, if you know a tribe called Red. Yeah, he's one of my closest friends. Mm. And just to see how powerful it is uh, when when indigenous people gather as one is just amazing. And I just want to say that that, that is, I'm so grateful for being in this community because it's so powerful and so loving and they can just keep on trying to kill us but they will not succeed. Never shut up, my native. I look out and I see a land Young and lovely Hard and strong Fifty thousand years we've danced her praises, read our thanks, and we've just begun. Oh, yes, this is my country, young and growing, free and flowing sea to sea. Yes, this is and that was our interview with Sami hip-hop artist and activist Maxida Marek and author and activist Gabriel Kuhn about Kuhn's 2019 release, Liberating Sotmi, Indigenous Resistance in Europe's Far North, available now through PM Press. 
If you're interested in learning more about Sami struggles, which cover a lot of ground between governments, forced, forcing reindeer culling, and anti-mining campaigns, check out our show notes for links from our guests. All music in this show is by Maxida Marek and used with her permission. You can check out her work on any streaming platform. You are now hearing a cover in English by Marek, which is Soldier Blue, originally by Buffy St. Marie, who is a composer and singer-songwriter of Cree and Mi'kmaq descent. St. Marie has a blurb on the back of Liberating Sapmi and is very highly regarded among Sami artists. Can't you see that there's some other way to love me? Yes, this is my country. I spring from her and I'm learning how to count upon her. Child to reason the corn is high. I love her And I'm learning how to take care of her When the new stories get me down I take a drink of freedom to think of Oh, North America from toe to crown It's never long before oh, I know just why I Long here, soldier blue, soldier blue. Can't you see that there's another way to love her? Soldier blue, soldier blue, soldier blue. Soldier blue. Can't you see that there's another way to love her? Soldier blue, soldier blue. Can't you see that there's another way to love her?